All right, let's um, go ahead and get our get started so that we can get you back to whatever you do every day to generate more business. Uh, that's important. Um, starting next week, Monday, and going on for several weeks, um, you might want to make sure that you are either here for huddle or watching the videos because we're going to start talking in a couple, in, beginning with next Monday, about specific what we call non-QM products. Sometimes at Connect, you'll hear Mike talk about private label products. They're actually, the, the, the terminology used in the mortgage industry is non-QM. QM stands for qualified mortgage. You probably heard that terminology in some of your uh, licensing classes, continuing ed, whatever. So we're going to start talking about non-QM uh, products. We're going to do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, kicking off with this month, I am beginning to offer non-QM products, which I have not done since um, COVID hit. When COVID hit, all the non-QM products went away for about six months, and they started trickling back, and they're back in pretty much full swing right now. So um, that's one reason. The other reason I'm going to start offering that product is that it's representative of somewhere, this is a big spread, but it depends on the lender, but somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of the amount of business that people are doing. And so, therefore, it's critical to be able to start offering that product when you need it. Now, for you personally, where this can be of benefit is when you're talking to people who are, who've got reasonably good credit. They can't have bad credit and get a non-QM product. That doesn't work. Um, but if they've got credit scores, again, depending on the nature of the product, above 660 or 680, certainly above 700, they're going to be able to get non-QM products, and you will be able to offer those as a means of something that you bring to the table that other real estate agents may not be talking about. And obviously that gives you, it's kind of like easy sell. I mean, easy sell has got to be one of the greatest things. It's amazing how many... I mean, I work with a lot of real estate agents from outside this office, and no one has a quote-unquote easy sell program. Now, they all can talk about open door or knock or the other product. They can talk about them, but nobody has that easy sell program that is offered that Mike put together with Dwayne and Jay and everybody else here, which is a great product. It's a great lead because you don't have to talk about one of the investors, you just give them easy sell. 11 different people will quote on it or some portion of those 11 will quote on it and you've got it. I don't know, I, none of the other real estate companies I work with, none are offering it in that same manner. Well, that's similar to what we want to be able to do for the non-QM product. We are actually going to put together for you some information from our marketing team that's going to be able to help you market the non-QM products. You'll be able to put it on videos. You'll be able to put it on um, maybe your newsletter or your email campaign, whatever you're using, so that you've got something to offer to people that other real estate agents may not be talking about. And we're going to have the specifics for you so that you'll be able, you don't have to know all the lending guidelines, you just have to know what's out there and some basics. And that's what we're going to give you. So beginning with next Monday, we'll start talking about non-QM products and I suspect probably go on for at least four weeks because there, there's quite a bit. And I want to be able to talk not just about the product, but how do you market it? How would it be a benefit to you or potentially to some of your clients? And open up some other avenues because let's face it, what do we all want? We're heading in 2022. Wouldn't it be nice to have some you know, things that are generated now so that we get to 2022, we start closing some loans. So uh, closing some transactions for you. All right, what I wanted to chat about today, I want to go back into something we've talked about somewhat recently, but talk about it again because it just keeps coming up and keeps coming up and keeps coming up, and that's appraisals. And what to expect of appraisals. Now I'm going to break that down in three different, in three different ways. If you recall, about a month, maybe a month and a half ago, I put up on the board an actual appraisal and showed you how they break it all down. Well, what I want to do today, I'm not going to put it up on the screen, I want to talk about two different things on appraisals that you and I need to know about so that we can help our clients. So the first thing about appraisals we need to know about is that 
the appraisal is supposed to be the value of what other homes in the market have recently sold at. Not what they're listed for, but what they've recently sold for. So that is what an appraisal is supposed to do. It's supposed to give you a market valuation based on what re similar type homes have recently sold for. That's what it's supposed to be. Now, let's face it. When you and I are working with a, working with a seller and the seller makes a comment and says that their home is worth $450,000 because a home across the street or a home down the block or the home in the subdivision, you know, that home is no bigger than mine and it sold for $500,000. Mine's got to be worth four fifty, dollars at least four fifty. dollars So when someone says that to you, what do you, what's your response to them? You're the agent. Someone says their home's got to be worth four fifty. dollars The home down the block is, is no bigger than theirs, and that one sold for five hundred. dollars makes theirs got to be worth four fifty. dollars What do you say to them? What's that? Do you have any other proof or evidence that shows you that besides? Do you have any other proof or evidence of what that, why that is? Somebody else, what would you say to somebody who says that? Well, let's look at the criteria and the, and the elements of that house and compare them to yours. Thank you, Jay. That's what I was looking for. Let's look at that house compared to yours. Now, I've watched Mike make this presentation, I don't know how many times over the last three years, and I love what Mike does. He asks, the, you know, people will say that to him, and he's even asking the question, what do you think your home is valued at? And they start coming up with all this information, well, based on that house, based on this house, based on this house. Well, I love what Mike has, has been saying for all these years. He actually has all of those already prepared in his little thing that he takes to the listing with him. He's already got the addresses because he knows what's sold. And he doesn't just take the ones that are comparable. He takes anything they might think of. And I'm thinking, that's brilliant. Because then I go to what Jay just got done saying. And, you know, well, your home is a ranch. That's a two-story brick home. Yours is a, a, a ranch um, stucco. So it's not the same necessarily, but you can't say that to them. But what you can do, if you've done what Mike does, is he's got this little sheet here. He says, well, yeah, you mentioned that home. I just happened to have brought that, the comparable on that home. Let's just take a look at the two. And he flips them over and shows them. He says, show me where, you know, there, there's some things that are similar and some things that are not. What stands out? Well, I know that mine's a ranch and that's a two-story. Well, okay, um, is there anything else? Well, the homes are comparable in size. As a matter of fact, they are comparable in size. Um, that home, anything else? Well, that home has a basement, mine's on a slab, but I got a second story. So what they're basically doing is talking themselves out of why that home is not a comparable. Now, why is that important? It's important because when the appraisal comes in on their home, that home's not gonna be used but you've set it up for them because they basically presented it already. And one of the things I've heard Mike say that I think is so powerful is that when that person is bringing that up, you can say, you and I might agree that your home is very similar because it's down the block. But I have to share something with you. I'm not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong. I just want to share something with you. The appraiser is not going to use that home. That might be terribly unfair. You and I might agree it's unfair, but they're not going to use that home. And they're not for the reasons that you've already mentioned. And I know that doesn't make you or I feel good, but that's the truth. Are there any homes that are ranches, stucco, maybe brick, but any homes that are ranches that are in the neighborhood or someplace nearby that you are thinking about or that you've... Um, well, there might be one, but that's it. Well, Mike then comes up and says, well, you know, I, I have found several. There's more than that. Let's take a look at those. Let's take a look at what's similar and what's not. 
the purpose of that is preparing the seller for what the appraiser is going to actually do. Because the appraiser is going to basically do that exercise. Now they're going to go into a lot more depth than that. But they're going to, do, they're going to try to find a specific, anywhere from three to six specific homes that are similar to the home that they're appraising. Now, bear in mind, they're not going to go walk through those homes. You know what they're going to do? They're going to look at the pictures that were online, and they're going to look at the description that those homes had on the, on the, on the MLS or FMLS sheets. That's all they're going to do. And they're going to base everything off of that. And sometimes that information is not 100% accurate. So if the comparables for a ranch in this particular, this particular case, if the comparables are showing 380 to 420, what's the probability of a 450 appraisal coming in? Chris, you're exactly right. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Because a two-story home down the block sold for 500 doesn't mean my ranch is going to sell for $450,000. No, it might get a contract for $450,000, but it likely is not going to get an appraisal if the comparables are 380 to 420. Does that make sense? Now, here's what I'm seeing happening. First of all, a lot of, it's amazing to me how good a lot of real estate agents really are and they're putting homes on the market for as close to what an appraisal might come in at, knowing full well that when they put it on the market, they're gonna get multiple offers and the contracts are gonna come in above list price. So if, if they think that the home is going to appraise at, say, 400, instead of putting it on the market for 420, they'll put it on at 400 knowing that they're probably going to get offers to 410, 415, 420, maybe even 430. But the good agents are already preparing their seller for the fact that we're not going to get an appraisal for 430, we're going to get it for 400. But if somebody puts an offer in for 420 and we accept the offer, how much is what we all now call the appraisal gap? And you know what? This is, and Jay can attest to this, you know, this, this term appraisal gap, the first time I heard that was about a year ago. You know, the first 30 years in the business, I never, did you ever hear of an appraisal gap? Never. We didn't have such a thing in Atlanta. Now it's common. So with the list, now as the, the agent, the listing agent prepares their seller for the fact that, hey, let's see how much of an appraisal gap we can get. 10,000, 15,000, maybe even 20,000. So whatever it happens to be, if it appraises for 400 and we got an appraisal gap for 15, even though the contract was 420, we're gonna, we're gonna get 415 and $15,000 over what we thought we might you know, list it for, we're, everybody's happy. So the good agents are already doing all of that. The reason that this is important, because the buyer and the seller need to be prepared for what the appraiser is actually going to do. And if the agents are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, and some agents do, some agents don't, <clears throat> the best ones do. I'll have a sit like, just like the, and I wanna share this because this happened last week. I got two great agents, my buyer's agent and the listing agent, working on a home where the, where the original list price was 389.9, so call it 390 just to make it simple. The offer went in at 412. The appraisal came in at $390,000, <clears> right where the listing agent said it would be, and right where my buyer's agent said it probably would come in at. They had a $15,000 appraisal gap. The new contract is now 405. Now here's, think about how this is working out. You have two agents who know exactly what they're doing. Everybody's well prepared. Seller got $15,100 over the list price. The buyer is getting a $7,000 break on the contract price. 
because it was written at 412 and your appraisal gap was 15,000, which the seller accepted, or in their case, the way it's written, they had to. So they're getting 405, so you've got a, two happy agents, you've got, two happy, you've got a happy seller and a happy buyer because everybody was prepared for what that appraiser might actually do. There's, nobody said you gotta go back and get a different price, nobody did anything. They just, everybody just smiled and said, we're done, let's go. So <clears throat> as an agent, one of the things that you can do is prepare the buyer or the seller for what the appraiser is actually going to do. So it's not about the value the appraiser is going to give it, it's what they're going to do, how they're going to arrive at a value. And somebody says, but isn't that subjective? Oh, yes. Very subjective. Do they use an average of the three or four or five comps that they use? Not necessarily. Inside the appraisal, they're going to put in there which you know, why they've put more weight on comp number one or comp number three or whatever it happens to be. Now, let's take the reverse side of that. That was number one. Number two, the reverse side of it is the appraiser missed the boat. I mean, you as the buyer's agent felt that this home should appraise at 400. The listing agent knew it should appraise at about 400. Um, you got a contract for 420 and the appraisal comes in at 375. And everybody knows that appraiser has got to be, either had a bad day on drugs or has no idea what they're doing. Because it, there's no way. That means there's a mistake someplace, very likely. Not for sure, but very likely. So one of the, th what do you and I do to be, be able to go back and say, okay, this is wrong? Well, it can't be fluff. And by fluff, I mean, well, our home has got upgrades. Our home has granite countertops. We redid the master bathroom. You know, I call it fluff. It's not fluff because it's actually money that somebody wrote a check for, but how do you know that the other five comps didn't have granite countertops? If they put it in the listing agreement or in the MLS, they may, then we, the appraiser may know that it had or didn't have granite countertops. But trust me, in that price range, the appraiser is not going to assume it doesn't have granite countertops. Well, we put in all hardwood floors. Okay, fine. That's, I have all hardwood floors in my house. I spent a lot of money on hardwood floors in my house. Somebody that walks in the house is going to see value in that and be willing to pay more. Does that mean I'll get a higher appraisal? No because he's gonna compare it to other like homes. If they've got new wall, if they've got new carpeting in all the rooms, and it might say that in the MLS thing, they're probably gonna get the same value that I'm gonna get, or I'm gonna get the same value that they have. Now, so what are the things that could be different? First of all, the appraiser didn't use the right comps. There was a private sale that went on that was three doors away that closed two weeks ago, and that one needs to be used. They didn't use it. Okay, so you tell the appraiser. I mean, mine's a two-story brick home. That's a two-story brick home. They were built about the same time. They're very similar, but you didn't know about that one because it didn't hit the courthouse yet or whatever it is. So can you add that one to it? Because that shows much closer to this value than what, than what you showed. You give that to an appraiser, every appraiser is gonna say, thank you, I'll do it. I mean, so now that gives something else. Next thing, I look down the column and see, did the appraiser evaluate my home properly? Did they get the room count right? Did they get the number of bathrooms right? Did they get the room, uh, the space downstairs in the basement? Is there correct unfinished, correct finished? Did they give me credit for the patio and deck and pool or whatever it happens to be that I've got around the house? They, 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 everything in my house, did they get it right? And all you do is look at the right side of the appraisal excuse me, left side of the appraisal, and it'll tell you everything and you can just check it, see if it's all right. If there's mistakes in there, we can point it out. Now, why is that important? Because now I gotta go to all the comps. And do all, did he get the information right on the comps? Now, it's a little bit more work, kind of a pain in the butt to be honest, but if, if it's off significantly, you might wanna look at that. 
and then you can point that out. Now, once we get that information, you get that information, you and the listing agent, you give it to the lender, and we then take that back to the appraiser and say, this is what we've got, would you look at this again? If it's more than fluff, if it's actual square footage is wrong, you miss the fact that we got a fence in our backyard. That's, a fence is probably, depending on the size, that's usually a two to $4,000 add-on. If, if you've got half of the basement finished and the appraiser didn't make note of that, that's a big deal. If the room count is wrong, that's a big deal. Square footage is wrong, that's a big deal. And the biggest one is, did they get all the right comps? So if they do that, then you can go back to the lender. Lender can then submit this to the appraiser and then come back with hopefully a corrected value. Make sense? Questions? All right, uh, we're gonna break, but I want to, before we walk out, remind you again, beginning with next week, we're gonna start with the non-QM products, and I think you're gonna find it relatively exciting. There's some really good stuff out there. Just a little tease, there's a, um, there's, you may have heard of bank statement loans, but they've also got loans out there called no ratio loans meaning the lender's not gonna look at the debt to income ratios to determine if they qualify for a, a mortgage. Now again, if somebody's got 595 credit score, they're not gonna get one of these loans. But if they've got a 700 or 720 credit score, they very well may qualify. Now, they're gonna have to put money down. It's not free. They're gonna have to prove their assets. They can't get it from, you know, they can't call me up and say, can you give me the money? No, you gotta ha prove your money. So there's some things that are going to come out, and we'll start talking about those next week. All right, thanks.